Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elisa Novak. I work at Fahrenheit, and today I will talk about the adsorption heat pumps, which are one of the main technologies in the heat for cool solution. I will start by introducing the fundamentals of the adsorption process, and then I will explain how to implement these fundamentals and build real machines. At the end, I will show how and why we use these machines in the heat for cool project. We have only 10 minutes for that path, so please stay focused and note your question for the Q&A session. Let's start by watching some short video. This demonstrator consists of two glass pots. One of them is filled with sorbent, the second one is filled with pure water. The bulbs are connected with each other, and in the middle here you can see a valve. The pressure inside the bulbs is very low. It's about 20 millibars, so we can call it a vacuum. And in this position, the valve is closed. And now we will see what happens when we open the valve. We are opening the valve now. And here, what you can see here is the formation of ice. Okay, so once again, what has happened here? Uh, when we opened the valve, the sorbent started to suck in the water and the pressure in the right bulb started to drop. Decreasing pressure caused the evaporation of water and decrease in its temperature, and that's why the water froze. So as you can see, uh, sorption processes can induce evaporative cooling just as a compressor does in all of the commonly used compression chillers and heat pumps. But what happens when the sorbent gets saturated with water and cannot absorb anymore? Can we somehow regenerate it? Well, of course, we can regenerate it, use it, use it again, and that process is called desorption. And now I will show you these two processes together, adsorption and desorption, and the differences between them. Let's start with the adsorption. During this process, the sorbent attracts the water molecules. In other words, it sucks in the vapor. At the same time, heat is released to the ambient, therefore we call this process exothermic. After some time, uh, the sorbent gets saturated with water, and if we, want it, if we want to dry it again, we have to somehow force the water molecules to leave. And we can do it by heating up the sorbent. And this process is called desorption or regeneration. Because we are adding the heat, we call this process endothermic. And as you can see right now, the water molecules are expelled from the solvent. So it means that the, what, the, the water vapor is released and the water molecules are expelled from the solvent. When we have the regenerated solvent, we can cool it down and then the adsorption process can start again. And what happens with water? Well, if we want to evaporate it in the next step, uh, we have to condense it, for example, in the right bulb again. In Fahrenheit machines, we use zeolite and silica gel as sorbents and pure water as refrigerant. Uh, but in the literature, you can find also other working pairs, for example, activated carbon, methanol. Okay. We already know how the process works, that it gives similar results as the mechanical compressor and regular chillers, and that we could use it for cooling purposes. But how could we build a real machine out of that? There are, are at least two basic challenges. The first one is how to supply the heat to the sorbent and water efficiently, and how to dissipate efficiently the heat arising in the adsorption and condensation processes. And the second challenge is how to keep this process continuous so that the machine delivers cold all the time. First of all, we have to replace the glass bulbs with heat exchangers. Then by circulating heat transfer fluid at different temperature levels, through these heat exchangers, we can warm up or cool down the sorbent, or we can supply or collect the heat from the water. Typically, we use pure water, as the heat transfer fluid due to its very good thermal properties, but I will use the acronym HTF to distinguish it easily from the refrigerant water. 
Okay, so we have two heat exchangers, our left bulb and our right bulb. Uh, one heat exchanger is coated with desorbent and it's called adsorber desorber. The second one is not coated and operates as evaporator condenser. In our demonstrator, we had a short piping with a valve in the middle that connected the two glass bulbs. In the real machine, we just put the two heat exchangers in one envelope made of thin sheets of stainless steel. And then we put precisely calculated amount of refrigerant water into this created chamber. The envelope has to be sealed very well, because as you remember from the demonstrator, the pressure inside is really low. Any ingress of air will cause a malfunction of our machine. Of course, this envelope is also thermally insulated, and that's actually what we call a module. A module uh, consists of two heat exchangers and one thermally insulated vacuum tight stainless steel chamber. And to keep this process continuous, we have to have at least two of such modules working out of phase. When in one module, the sorbent is adsorbing water, in the second module, the sorbent is being regenerated. And that's how it looks in a real machine. We have two thin and tube heat exchangers, one of which, typically the bigger one, is coated with the sorbent. In this case, it's silica gel. And the second one, which is not coated, and the heat transfer fluid, HTF, flows inside the tubes. Here in this slide, on the left-hand side, you can see the adsorption evaporation phase. As you know from the previous slides, in the adsorption process, the heat is released to the ambient. Therefore, we need HTF at medium temperature level, MT, circulating through the adsorber, cooling it down. On the other hand, the evaporation process collects the heat from the HDF. That's our cooling effect. And HDF at low temperature, LT, circulates through the evaporator. On the right side, you see desorption condensation phase. And since we have to add the heat to the sorbent um, in order to regenerate it, HDF at high temperature, HT, has to flow through the desorber, warming it up. During the condensation process, Similarly, like in case of adsorption, uh, the heat is released and has to be dissipated. And here we use HDF at medium temperature again. The main components of our adsorption heat pumps uh, are the process modules. It's always an even number of process modules. So either two, four, six, or eight of them. A hydraulic group, which consists of pumps and three-way valves directing the HDF at the right temperature levels to corresponding heat exchangers. We have control cabinet with human machine interface, and of course, we have casing with frames. Here at the top, you can see the connections of the three circuits mentioned above. Uh, the LT has to be connected to the cold distribution circuits, for example, fan coils. The HT has to be connected with a source of heat, for example, solar collectors, and MT is the heat dissipation circuit. This one may be connected with a dry cooler, wet cooling tower, swimming pool, underground heat exchangers, basically anything where you can dissipate the heat at proper uh, temperature levels. Till now, I have focused on cooling, but it is also possible to use the adsorption heat pumps for heating. All you need to do is to set a corresponding operation mode on the HMI and connect the external HD, MT, and LT circuits a bit differently than for cooling. In the heating mode, the machine's LT circuit should be connected to the low temperature heat source, and MT should be connected to the heating system, for example, floor heating. There are no changes in HD. This circuit should be connected with high temperature heat source as before. On this SAN-K diagram, you can see how simple uh, is the energy balance of the heat pump. Heat supplied through the HT and LT equals to the heat dissipated through the empty circuit. Okay, and now when you know what the adsorption heat pump is and how it works, I can explain you what is our role in the Heat for Cool project. So this technology is innovative. It's definitely worth further development. That's why we need such funded projects to make it happen. First of all, it uses heat instead of electricity to provide cooling. 
Uh, then it uses adsorption process, which is less popular than absorption process, but allows the use of lower dry heat temperatures, which makes it perfectly suitable for flat solar collectors for solar cooling. And moreover, the refrigerant is pure water. Pure water is safe for people and safe for our environment. In the Heat for Cool project, we have developed a prototype of a new solar-assisted absorption heat pump as shown here in this picture. Our machine is also installed at one demo site, the demo site in Valencia. There our heat source are solar collectors. We dissipate the heat in the dry cooler installed on the roof and the generated cooling effect is used for air conditioning with fan coils. And I will not go into details here because uh, I hope you will hear more about this installation during the webinar devoted especially to Valencia demo site. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I raised your interest in the absorption technology. Any questions are welcome. And you can also email me for further information if needed.